Greetings, everybody. It's time for our weekly session. <laughs> we all just keep coming together week after week to get more information on menopause. And sometimes we go even further than just menopause. Sometimes we discuss things that are specific, not only to menopause, but to your health status in general. Today is one of those times. We are in the midst of a big unit on epithelial ovarian cancer. And I've given you individual video tutorials on each factor in the list. Here's a chart of all the risk factors. One of the items on the chart is listed more than once. Which one? Endometriosis. You see it in the pink personal history category of risk factors and also in the red inflammation category of risk factors. And I've made it bold in both locations. But it's actually there more than just those two times. It's implied in the reproductive history category, even though it isn't listed outright. So there are actually three different ways in which endometriosis can increase your risk of epithelial ovarian cancer. And that brings up the question, does endometriosis cause epithelial ovarian cancer? Well, that's what we're going to consider in this video. This video is a bonus. You will not find a discussion on this in my book in either the first or the second edition. So you need to stay right here. <laughs> you know how organized I am. And you know my organization enhances your education. So let's do this in an organized manner. First, I'll give you a review on endometriosis itself, explaining what it is. Then I'll explain why it falls into the risk factor categories of personal history, inflammation, and reproductive history although I'll reverse the order of these items to coincide with the order of events as they occur in real life. And finally, I'll explain the relationship between endometriosis and epithelial ovarian cancer. Okay, starting with a review on endometriosis. I first introduced you to endometriosis in video number 138. You learned that it's all due to having periods. The word endometriosis comes from the word endometrium, and endometrium is the inner lining of your uterine cavity, right there. You're very familiar with this. Your endometrium is the tissue that builds up and thickens each month before your period, so it becomes thick like this. And it's the tissue that sheds when you have your period, so that's when it becomes thin, like this. So your menstrual cycles are a result of hormones acting on your endometrium to make it thicken in order to cushion a fertilized egg should you get pregnant. And if you don't get pregnant, it sheds. So your period actually consists of your endometrium. Your uterus expels it through your cervix and out of your body via your vagina. So the normal direction is like this. Now you've already seen what your periods look like. I mean, it's drops of blood. But you can see that there is actually tissue in the blood. And that tissue is your endometrium. So endometriosis is when some of that tissue in your endometrium goes the wrong way. Instead of exiting out your body through your vagina, it goes backward. So it backs its way up your fallopian tubes and exits out the end of your fallopian tube. So it's blood from your uterus going this direction instead of that direction. Very, very, very straightforward. 
So the first step in the development of endometriosis is transportation of normal endometrium in the wrong direction. And what's going to happen to those drops of blood that contain endometrial tissue when they get to the end of your fallopian tubes? Well, you have openings on the fallopian tubes and that blood is going to end up dripping out the end of your fallopian tube and fall on to whatever is nearby. Well, your endometrial tissue is programmed to be a cushion for a fertilized egg. You shed it from your uterus if you don't get pregnant. So once you expel it from your vagina, it dies because it has no purpose. But when it travels from your uterus, up your fallopian tube, and out into your pelvis, it doesn't realize that its job is done. It thinks it's still supposed to form a cushion for a fertilized egg. So the drop of blood containing endometrial tissue implants wherever it falls. And the implant just makes the wrong location its new home. It's kind of like a squatter. It burrows in and implants wherever it lands. So the second step in the development of endometriosis is implantation. And once it implants, it just does in its new location the same thing it did in your uterus. Each month, it builds up and bleeds builds up and bleeds over and over and over again every month. With this repeated building up and bleeding, the endometriosis implant can get bigger or bury deeper. I don't want to spill my red dye there. <laughs> so your endometrial tissue is programmed to build up and bleed no matter where it is in your body. It doesn't realize that it's no longer in your uterus. The fact is that it's still in your body. And as long as it's in your body, it's going to build up and bleed. Now, your body is smart. It knows when something isn't quite right. So this bleeding that occurs in the wrong location alerts your body to the fact that something is wrong. Your body views the bleeding as undesirable, and it mounts its normal reaction against undesirable occurrences, inflammation. So the third step in the development of endometriosis is inflammation. Inflammation is your body's first step in trying to fix something that is wrong. The bleeding of the misplaced endometrial tissue represents a raw spot, a sore, an injury. And whenever your body has a raw spot, a sore, or an injury, it tries to protect it. Protecting the sore is part of your body's effort to heal. And the first step in healing is to seal over the raw spot. Your body just wants to cover it in order to protect it. It wants to basically put a band-aid on it. So any nearby anatomical structure will try to cover the raw spot. Here's our anatomical model of endometriosis. It's going to try to cover the raw spot, putting a band-aid on it. But as an anatomical structure tries to protect the raw spot, it has to come into contact with it. And that constitutes the fourth step in the development of endometriosis, which is communication. The, the band-aid basically touches another surface, but whatever it touches, it gets stuck. So instead of just being a band-aid, it ends up being much more like Velcro, like a permanent attachment. And this getting stuck traps the anatomical structure that covered the raw spot. If it's your intestine, 
It can no longer move freely. If it's your fallopian tube, it can no longer hang freely. In essence, any part of your anatomy that tries to cover the raw spot ends up getting stuck to the bleeding endometrial tissue. Once it's stuck, it's immobilized. So that constitutes the fifth step in the development of endometriosis, immobilization or stagnation. And once it's immobilized, it begins to get thick like a scab. So it's almost like the Velcro not only ends up being like this, it ends up being double thickness. It gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And eventually it even gets tougher like a scar. The name for scar tissue inside your body is adhesions. And adhesions can be filmy, filmy connections, or they can be very thick bands. Eventually, the scar tissue becomes so thick and tough that it's almost more like cement. So adhesion creation is the sixth step in the development of endometriosis. So here's a model demonstrating endometriosis, which is all the red dots everywhere you see them, and some adhesions. What I've done is I've put some rubber bands here of one pelvic structure attached to another. So what is in this area where endometriosis can form? Well, it's everything in your pelvis. Here's a pelvic model. You've got your cervix, your uterus, your fallopian tubes out here, your ovaries dangling from the fallopian tubes, but that's not all. You've also got intestines and your bladder. You've got all these structures in your pelvis. This means that all these structures can have endometriosis on them. And it also means that any of them can be adherent to any of the others when adhesions form. Your ovary can be stuck to your intestine, or your bladder can be stuck to your uterus, or your fallopian tube can be stuck to your uterus. Heck, they can all be stuck to each other. With time, adhesions can become so dry that they glue together, sealing two structures to each other permanently. And with more time, they can actually become cemented together. So here's a uterus with an adherent fallopian tube and ovary. You see, they're supposed to be separate from each other. The fallopian tube should have the ovary dangling freely below it. And they should not be in contact with the uterus. But instead of dangling freely, what you have here is the uterus, fallopian tube, and ovary all cemented to the uterus. And it's all because of endometriosis. The cement is just your body's normal reaction to tissue that's in the wrong location. Now, another thing that can happen is that if you've got endometriosis, this tissue going backward up the fallopian tube and dripping out into the pelvis. Another thing that can happen is that a lot of blood can collect in your ovary. I mean, your ovaries are located directly below the open ends of your fallopian tubes. So they are a prime location for collecting endometriosis. And we have a special name for such an ovarian cyst that is due to endometriosis. It's called endometrioma. An endometrioma is an ovary that is full of endometriosis, and it looks like this. Instead of being small like that, it is huge like this, and adhesions form between the ovary and the uterus. So this, an endometriosis, 
endometrioma constitutes one of the kinds of ovarian swellings that I talked about way back in video number 416. If endometriosis implants collect in an ovary month after month after month, the ovary can become very big and swollen with blood. Now, another possibility is for the endometriosis to bury into the muscular wall of your uterus. It would still be in your uterus, but it's in the wrong layer of your uterus. It's supposed to be here, not here. So you have an implant here, here, here. They're all the same thing, adenomyosis. Once it's in this deeper layer of the uterus, it cannot shed because it's buried too deeply to shed. So what does it do? It builds up and bleeds, builds up and bleeds, builds up and bleeds over and over and over again every month in the wrong layer. And there's a special name for endometriosis that is in your uterine wall too. It's adenomyosis. Adenomyosis is endometriosis that exists in the deep muscular layer of your uterus instead of in the superficial endometrial lining of your uterus. So endometriosis can really wreak havoc in your pelvis, all because a little endometrial tissue got confused, traveled in the wrong direction, and dripped into your pelvis. Once there, both the endometrial tissue and your body do exactly what they're destined to do. And the result is a bunch of cemented-like scar tissue that plasters your organs together. Now, even though the endometriosis started out as nothing but tiny drops of blood, the sequential steps that follow make it seem as if there's actual dissemination of the disease. We typically use the word dissemination in the context of cancer. Dissemination means spread to other locations. Endometriosis disseminates, but endometriosis is not cancer. And yet, it disseminates to other locations and wreaks havoc in a way that is similar to cancer. So the successive steps in this development of endometriosis are transportation, implantation, inflammation, communication, immobilization or stagnation, creation of adhesions, and dissemination. Isn't it just dandy that they all in T-I-O-N? <laughs> So that's it for the review of endometriosis itself. Now I'll segue into explaining why our three categories of risk factors increase your risk for epithelial ovarian cancer by means of endometriosis. The first is your reproductive history. Who gets endometriosis? You already know that your hormone cycles make your endometrium thicken and then shed each month. This is your cycle. Every time you don't get pregnant, your endometrium thickens and then sheds. And it's all governed by your hormones. This is our hormone graph that you've seen many times. What this means is that each cycle creates an opportunity for endometriosis to develop. With each cycle, there is a potential for some of your endometrium to go the wrong way. Every single cycle is a setup. And any endometrial tissue that goes in the wrong way and backs up your fallopian tubes can lead to endometriosis. And let me qualify something. Even if you have a visible period some of your endometrium can go the wrong way. This is not an all or none thing. Some endometrial tissue can go this direction and some can go in that direction. My arrows aren't that great. <laughs> well, there goes one of my arrows. 
they can go both ways, okay? Endometrial tissue can come out of your vagina and some can back its way up your fallopian tube, all during the very same cycle. But the bottom line is this, the more cycles you have, the more opportunities you have to develop endometriosis. Put another way, the fewer pregnancies you have, the more opportunity you have to develop endometriosis. Anything that interrupts your cycles decreases your chances of having endometriosis. So pregnancy in which your cycles are interrupted for about 10 months decreases your risk of endometriosis. Breastfeeding during which most women have no periods decreases your risk of endometriosis. And using birth control in a continuous regimen in which you never have a period decreases your risk of endometriosis. The more periods you have, the greater your risk for endometriosis, period. We used to call endometriosis the career woman's disease, and that was because career women were the ones who had period after period after period with no interruptions. But what are the reproductive history characteristics that increase your risk for epithelial ovarian cancer. The same things that increase your risk for endometriosis. Here they are on our isolated reproductive risk factor chart. It all boils down to this. The more menstrual cycles you have, the higher your risk for both endometriosis and epithelial ovarian cancer. So that's why endometriosis is a hidden risk factor in this reproductive history category. Now that brings us to the second category of risk factors that includes endometriosis, personal history. Here it is on the isolated risk factor chart for that. Notice that there are only three personal history entities listed, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, and endometriosis. So it appears that instead of designating endometriosis as a reproductive factor, it's listed as a medical history factor. But you don't even have to know that you had endometriosis for it to increase your risk for epithelial ovarian cancer. And there is no requirement that the degree of endometriosis be severe. Unfortunately, the only way to make a definitive diagnosis of endometriosis is to see it at the time of surgery. Short of that, it's only speculation. This means that you may have endometriosis and not know it. Now, if you're thinking, well, I've never had any symptoms, so I must not have it, you could be grossly mistaken. One of the odd things about endometriosis is that the severity of symptoms is not dependent on the severity of disease. You can have very severe endometriosis, but very mild symptoms. You can have very mild endometriosis, but very severe symptoms. Or you can have any combination of disease severity and symptom severity. So this makes the personal history of endometriosis risk factor a bit unreliable for some women. And the third category of risk factors that includes endometriosis is inflammation. Here it is listed along with talcum powder and pelvic inflammatory disease on our isolated chart. But wait, inflammation is an actual step in the sequence of events that I delineated in the review on how endometriosis develops. So inflammation is both a risk and a result. That means this designation as an inflammatory risk factor is somewhat redundant. Well, if endometriosis is a risk factor for epithelial ovarian cancer in three different ways, could it be 
that it's really a precursor to cancer or even a pre-cancer? Let's explore this possibility. Let's start by delineating the characteristics that endometriosis and epithelial ovarian cancer have in common. First, both behave in ways typical of cancer. They both travel to distant sites and implant, and they both cause damage to nearby anatomy. However, endometriosis does this as a result of your body's normal functions, whereas cancer does this as a result of cells that lose control and replicate exponentially. Second, both endometriosis and epithelial ovarian cancer can cause an ovarian swelling. For endometriosis, we call the swelling an endometrioma, but it is not cancer. For epithelial ovarian cancer, the swelling can be one of many different kinds of cancer. In video number 418, I taught you about the four different kinds of epithelial ovarian cancer. Here's the chart we created in that video. I likened your reproductive tract to the buildings and cars along a train track. And you learn that epithelial ovarian cancers can originate from different kinds of cells along your reproductive tract. So the four kinds of epithelial ovarian cancers are serous, originating in cells resembling your ovaries or fallopian tubes, endometrioid or clear cell, originating in cells resembling your endometrium, and mucinous, originating in cells resembling your cervix. Well, it just so happens that the only epithelial ovarian cancers that can possibly arise from endometriosis are the ones that originate in cells resembling your endometrium. That would be endometrioid and clear cell cancers only. Now, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Endometriosis, endometrioid cancer, and clear cell cancer all involve endometrial cells. The difference between endometrioid cells and clear cells is that endometrioid cells resemble your endometrium when you are not pregnant, while clear cells resemble your endometrium when you are pregnant. So that suggests that it is possible for endometriosis to transform into cancer. And indeed it is, but it's only possible, not probable. So that brings us to the question of just how possible is it? In other words, what's the relative risk? Relative risk refers to your risk of developing epithelial ovarian cancer with endometriosis compared to your risk of developing epithelial ovarian cancer without endometriosis. Another way of saying this is just how much does it increase your risk? Well, the relative risk is 1.3 to 1.9. We always use one as the baseline for relative risk. So compared to a risk of one, your risk increases by 0.3 to 0.9. And the only kinds of epithelial ovarian cancer risk that increase at all with endometriosis are endometrioid and clear cell cancers. But those two are very uncommon. Here's the pie chart you saw in video number 418 
demonstrating the distribution of epithelial ovarian cancers among the four cell types. That huge blue section is the serous, serous ovarian cancers. The orange region is the clear cell ovarian cancers. The gray sliver is endometrioid ovarian cancers. And the yellow sliver is mucinous ovarian cancers. The serious serous ovarian cancers comprise more than 85% of all ovarian cancer. Endometrioid constitutes only about 10% and clear cell constitutes only about 3%. So endometriosis does not increase your risk for the most common and most serious serous epithelial ovarian cancer. And that means it contributes very, very, very little to your risk of epithelial ovarian cancer overall. In summary, while endometriosis is listed as a risk factor for epithelial ovarian cancer, the increased risk is extremely low. And it is increased for only two very uncommon kinds of epithelial ovarian cancer, which are endometrioid and clear cell. Actual transformation of endometriosis into epithelial ovarian cancer is extremely rare, but possible. I hope I did an adequate job of answering the question as to whether endometriosis can become cancer. I told you at the very beginning of this unit that epithelial ovarian cancer is a complicated, understudied disease for which we have only fuzzy information. And this makes teaching you about it complicated, but I'm doing my best. <laughs> In the next video, I'm going to present some of the things about epithelial ovarian cancer that are so fuzzy. <laughs> and what you've learned here today about endometrioid and clear cell cancers will come in handy next week. So that's all for today. Stay here to subscribe. Go to menopausetaylor.me to schedule a consultation and visit me on all the social media channels to follow me. I will see you again in a week. <laughs> Bye! Thank you.